My name is Lorraine Maki. On behalf of the Lexington Town Celebrations Committee, I want to welcome you to Lexington's Memorial Day celebration. Today, we commemorate all men and women who have died in military service for the United States. During COVID-19, volunteers safely visited many war memorials throughout Lexington and prepared this video in remembrance of Lexingtonians who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. We wish we could be celebrating with you in person, but hopefully this video will be the next best thing. Hello, I'm Larry Conley, captain of the Lexington Minutemen. Why do we celebrate Memorial Day? The earliest celebrations occurred after the Civil War. Towns in the North began the practice of decorating the graves of fallen soldiers in the spring. On May 5th, 1868, General John A. Logan called for a nationwide day of remembrance later that month. The 30th of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of stewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion. Originally known as Decoration Day, it was extended to honor all those lost their lives in service to their country. It came to be called Memorial Day and became a federal holiday in 1971. Two hundred and forty-five years ago, Lexington's Minutemen vowed to sacrifice our estates and everything dear in life, yea, life itself, in support of the common cause. On April 19th of 1775, they were called upon to fulfill that pledge. Lexington's Minutemen, under the command of Captain John Parker, stood on Lexington Green that April morning to resist the Redcoats march through town. Ten made the ultimate sacrifice that day. The youngest person to stand on the green that day, and the last to die in 1854, was Jonathan Harrington, who was 16 when he served as a fifer for the militia on April 19, 1775. Our monument to these Minutemen stands across from the green next to Buckman Tavern, where many of them gathered before the battle. Close to the memorial for the Minutemen is a memorial for Prince Estabrook. In 1775, Prince Estabrook, an enslaved black man, became the first African-American combatant in the American Revolution and was wounded as he, along with his fellow Minutemen, faced the Redcoats on Lexington Green. He was one of hundreds of black soldiers who came forward to fight the Redcoats that day. Prince Estabrook died in Ashby, Massachusetts, as a free man at the age of 90. This memorial is dedicated to Prince Estabrook and to the thousands of other courageous black patriots long denied the recognition they deserve. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah. It was some 85 years after the Battle of Lexington that our citizens again were asked to sacrifice, this time to preserve a bitterly divided nation during our Civil War. To date, this has been America's bloodiest conflict. More than 600,000 died in the line of duty, 51,000 in the Battle of Gettysburg alone. Three members of the Muzzy family from Lexington served their country. Loring Muzzy and his younger brother George served in the Webster Regiment of the 12th Massachusetts Volunteers. A third brother, Charles, enlisted in the Navy. Loring Muzzy wrote home, We reached Baltimore and marched through the city with colors flying and the band playing. We were not molested. Continuing by cars, we reached the Potomac River and went into camp about a mile from Harper's Ferry on the Maryland side, and right here, our real army life commenced. 
July 27th, 1861. The scenes for which the regiment had so long been anxiously desiring, how often our men used to say, oh, the Webster Regiment are never going to see any real active army service. How few of these lively young men ever lived to return home and tell their experience. One who did not return to tell of his experience was Charles Muzzy, Loring's brother. Charles served aboard the USS Housatonic in the blockade of Charleston. He was killed in what was the first submarine torpedo strike against a U.S. warship. In one of his letters home, he included a drawing he had made of his ship. Today, especially, we remember him and his brothers. Among those who did return to Lexington to tell of his experiences was Private Thomas Cosgrove. And what a story was his to tell. Thomas, an immigrant from Ireland, came to this country in 1846 and to Lexington in 1847. He enlisted in 1862 and served with Company F, 40th Massachusetts Infantry until the end of the war. When Richmond fell, he was one of the first to enter the city. At Drury's Bluff, Virginia, he single-handedly disarmed and captured seven prisoners concealed in a cellar. For his extraordinary courage, in this action he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. He is the only Lexington resident to receive this high honor. After the war, Thomas operated a farm on Maple Street and raised five children in Lexington. Another veteran of the Civil War with an amazing story to tell was John H. Brown. John was born a slave and ran away to join the Navy in 1861. He served aboard the U.S. bark Ferdinina, which was ordered to duty in Virginia and the Carolinas. John found himself in Boston at the end of the war with not much more than the threadbare clothes on his back. By chance, he started to walk north and west stopping at the home of Adam Peters on East Street in Lexington, where he received a friendly welcome and made his home here for the rest of his life. He was an honored member of the Hancock Church for many years. So many stories, so many contributions. There is David Fitch, a farmer and carpenter, who built the house he and his family lived in on Adam Street when he returned to Lexington after the war. He was an integral part of life in the town in the years after the war. And there is Leonard Gardner Babcock. Although his youth was spent in Lexington, he found himself in Illinois when the war broke out, and he enlisted in E Company of the 11th Illinois Infantry. He was severely wounded at Fort Donlin, Tennessee, but saw subsequent service at Vicksburg. Returning to Lexington in 1866, he served as postmaster from 1867 to 1890, and also served terms as town clerk and tax collector. His store was the welcome headquarters for all the boys, perhaps to listen to his stories. So many from our town have served. We cannot mention all of their stories, but we can and do honor their service, their sacrifice, and their contributions. After some 50 years of relative peace, Lexington's sons again gathered on the green before marching off to serve in the Great War, World War I. Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria fought the Allied forces of Great Britain, France, Italy, Romania, Japan, Russia, and the United States. By the time the Allies declared victory and the armistice was signed, more than 16 million military and civilians had been killed. Shortly before he was mortally wounded in France, Stanley Hill wrote to his father. Please do not let mother read our letters to you if you think she would worry too much. Remember that we are in this war to the finish, and if our time comes, we are glad to go if, in the meantime, we have done a noble work. We must all join the fight for humanity and civilization, whatever the outcome. We remember all who served during the Great War, but today we especially remember Stanley and the other seven of Lexington's young men who did not return. Eight trees were planted on Lexington's battle green in their honor. 
In Flanders' fields the poppies blow Between the crosses, row on row, That mark our place, and in the sky The larks still bravely singing fly, Scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago, We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, Loved and were loved, and now we lie In Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. We'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know where. World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. It wasn't. A mere 20 years later, war again broke out in Europe as Germany, allied with Japan and Italy, tried to assert its power over the rest of Europe and the world. On April 19, 1942, 2,000 members of the Women's Defense Corps from all over the state participated in a two-mile parade in Lexington. Over 5,000 spectators lined the parade route, which ended on Lexington Green. Chairman of the Selectmen, Archie Giroux, read the pledge the Minutemen had made in 1775, to sacrifice our estates and everything dear in life, yea, life itself, in support of the common cause, and asked the spectators to repeat it. Some 1,400 Lexington residents served, and approximately 60 perished in World War II. At the very beginning of America's participation in the war, right after Pearl Harbor, one of those who would fall, Paul Frederick Adler, stationed in Hawaii, wrote home to his parents, who had thought him safely in hospital. I am glad you thought I was still in the hospital, since, as you say, it would probably have been safer there. However, this will be all I'll say about the war situation. As it actually was, I was discharged from the hospital on Saturday, December 6th, and, as you know, the fireworks started the next morning. Believe me, I'll never forget what I saw Sunday, and I am never glad and consider myself lucky that I came out okay and back to work again. If I get my ticket to the happy hunting ground, I can sincerely say that I'll have a clear conscience in believing that I've done the best I could and... Although I have made a few foolish mistakes, I can say that I am sorry for them. Most of Paul's correspondence home was about the wonderful young woman he had met in Hawaii, whom he married there, and of their plans for the future and the child they were expecting. Paul was a fighter pilot whose unit, the 42nd Bomb Squadron of the 7th Army Air Corps, was assigned to the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. His last known mission was on February 1st, 1943. He was reported missing in action as of that day, the same day his son was born. Another of Lexington's own, Matt Allen, was stationed in the Solomon Islands in 1943. He also was a fighter pilot and was assigned to the 216th Marine Fighter Squadron. Matt had been an honor student and a star athlete in high school who still found time to work at the Lexington Theater and volunteer at his church. He enlisted right after graduation. On December 29, 1943, he led his squadron in his Corsair Fu-1 and engaged a number of Japanese aircraft. After hitting two enemy aircraft, he was shot down and killed. The year after he was killed, his family established the Matt Allen College Scholarship Fund at Lexington High School with Matt's total savings, the grand sum of $400. That fund is still helping students attend college. The VFW Hall in Lexington bears his name. Today, the bell rescued from the remains of the USS Lexington plays an important role in our town celebrations. The Lexington was lost in the Battle of the Coral Sea, May 4th through 8th of 1942, along with 216 of its crew. Among those lost was a young man from Lexington, William Stevens, who had lived on Brant Street. He enlisted in the Naval Reserves soon after the war was declared and served 
as an aviation machinist's mate second class. So much is owed to these young people, and we wish there were time to tell all of their stories. You can learn more about them and others on the Facebook page, Lexington Remembers World War II. Here are the names of the fallen. devastating carnage of World War II was enough to end all wars. In June 1950, 107,000 highly trained soldiers of the North Korean People's Army launched a devastating attack on an unsuspecting South Korea. What started as a local battle became an international war when the United Nations sent U.S.-led forces into South Korea and the People's Republic of China came to the aid of North Korea. The war left Korea divided and helped in usher the Cold War. Nearly 40,000 Americans died in the three-year conflict and more than 100,000 were wounded. Today we remember them and especially the 200 Lexington residents who served in the Korean conflict. We especially remember Navy Petty Officer First Class George E. Hay and Army Sergeant Donald H. Farnham both reported as missing in action in Korea. And on this Memorial Day, we also remember with a full measure of gratitude and respect the three Lexingtonians who made the ultimate sacrifice during the Vietnam War, Stephen A. Spears, Philip S. Gallagher III, and Charles Christopher Child, as well as the many others of our native sons and daughters who served in this war. Charles Christopher Childs, as a young person, read the story about the Battle of Lexington. To him, it symbolized what was brave and honorable and true about the fight for liberty and our democratic tradition. Most of his family is from California, but when he signed his papers for the army, he said he was from Lexington, and that is what remains on his record. Today, we also hold in memory Dinesh L. Rajbandari, Private First Class with the Army 82nd Airborne B Company 33rd Platoon. Dinesh spent his school years in Lexington, graduating from Lexington High School in 1982. An excellent soccer player, he helped his high school team compete in the state finals. 
Even as a young boy, Dinesh would say he wanted to go into the army, and he enlisted after graduating from high school. He died in his country's service in Granada on November 23, 1983. Lexington recognizes that it is not only our military who pledge to risk all for the common cause. Our first responders make this pledge every day they report to work. Today, we remember our firefighters and police who have been called upon to make that ultimate sacrifice. The Lexington Fire Department Memorial honors all Lexington firefighters past and present who have served the residents of Lexington since 1857. The memorial is also a special tribute to the five Lexington firefighters who have given the supreme sacrifice and died in the line of duty. A fireman's prayer. When I am called to duty, God, wherever flames may rage, give me strength to save some life, whatever be its age. Help me to embrace a little child before it is too late, or to save an older person from the horror of that fate. Enable me to be alert and hear the quickest shout, and quickly and efficiently to put the fire out. I want to fill my calling and to give the best in me, to guard my ever neighbor and to protect their property. And if, according to my fate, I am to lose my life, God please bless with your protecting hand my children and my wife. Today, we also want to pay a special tribute to Lexington's police, past and present, and especially to Patrolman James J. Hodgson III, who died in the line of duty in 1967. We want to end our program with the words best express the debt that we the living owe our country's fallen. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. This concludes our program. Please note that wreaths have been placed at the memorials mentioned here. Please visit them, and if you do, Take a picture of yourself and send it to Town Celebrations. We will display them on our website and, who knows, 
you may find yourself in a future video. Thank you.